as we go through this series, that there is a complete change in the way we pray and receive in the New Testament compared to the Old Testament. And most people don't make a distinction there. To them, the only difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant is just a blank page in your Bible, just like this right here. That's, that's about it. They just think that this is the Old Covenant, this is the New Covenant. But it means an old contract, a way of God dealing with people. And under the New Covenant, I tell you, Jesus changed everything. And I'm going to say some statements that I'll explain more as we get into this. But if you pray the way that Moses prayed, the way that Abraham prayed, the way that David prayed, you are missing God. And I know that that sounds nearly blasphemous to some people, but I can guarantee you if Moses, David, Abraham, Elijah, Elisha were here today, they would take advantage of the new covenant and what Jesus provided for us. And there is a different way to pray today, and most people don't know that. And so I'll get into this and explain it more. This will probably be into next week's programs. But actually, Jesus changed things so much that if you pray the way that Moses, David, Abraham, all of these people prayed, it's actually against what Jesus did. You're starting from a position of unbelief. You are begging God, thinking that you've got to do something to move God when the truth is Jesus bought us access to God in a way that no Old Testament saint ever had. I'm not saying that what they did was wrong. At the time, it was exactly the way that they were supposed to pray. But Jesus changed everything. And today, we just rest in what Jesus has already done. And yet, there are a lot of Christians who are praying, trying to get God to do something. They feel the burden and the responsibility, and they come and they beg, and they plead with God. And I tell you, this is why so many people who are prayer warriors, intercessors, are beat down. They're sad. They they have a, a sorrow and a grief about them because they feel like they have to do something to move God, to get God to move. And I tell you, to take the place of Jesus and try and do what He's already done is just laborious. And I tell you, you make a very poor Savior. So we need to rest in what Jesus has already done for us. So again, let me start with uh, Matthew chapter 6. This is Jesus' teaching on prayer. And before he uh, gets into teaching what prayer is, he teaches what prayer isn't. And so I'm going to take that same approach. And let me just say that I know that what I'm saying here is going to be offensive. It's not intended to hurt anybody. And again, I say that I entitle this a better way to pray because everything that I will teach again, I won't counter a single thing in your prayer life that I haven't had to change in my prayer life. And yet I loved God and God loved me, but I'm getting better results now than I used to. I'm not saying I've got it all figured out. I'm not saying it's perfect, but I tell you my relationship with God has just gone to brand new levels as he's taught me how to pray. I'm getting better results. And so let me introduce it by saying this, that if you spend a lot of time praying and yet you feel frustrated and it doesn't seem like what you're praying for is coming to pass, then don't be so defensive that you want to sit here and defend something that isn't working. I'm not against prayer, but I'm against wrong type of praying. I'm against a lot of religious tradition that has made the power of prayer of none effect. In Mark chapter 7, verse 13, Jesus was teaching and he says, your traditions and doctrines of men make the word of God of none effect. And I believe that prayer is one of the most religious uh, traditions that we have in the Christian church today. People have all kinds of wrong ideas and wrong attitudes about prayer. And if you got wrong belief, you're going to get wrong results. So I'm just saying these things as introduction to encourage you that I know that this will be different for many people from what they're used to, but that doesn't mean it's wrong. And if your prayer life isn't just effective, if you aren't seeing great results, then maybe you ought to entertain the idea that there's a better way to pray. So Jesus, in Matthew chapter 6, in verse 5, he says, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, 
for they love to pray. Now, let, I'm going to go on, but let me just stop right here and say that when Jesus started talking about prayer, this is a radical statement, but he says, don't be like the hypocrites. They love to pray. So let me just start with a bomb from the very beginning that you know what? Hypocrites love to pray. So all prayer is not good because hypocrites love to pray. The hypocrites of Jesus' day were the scribes and the Pharisees, and he will go on and talk about this, that they actually hired people to blow a trumpet so that people would notice them and they would stand on a street corner and they would pray in a loud voice so that they could get a claim from people. I guarantee you that did not bless God. It did not connect with God. If anything, that just reinforced all of the flesh the devil was wanting to do in their life. They were doing it for themselves to get praise and honor and glory. And the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5 that God resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. If you're praying like that, I guarantee you it's not doing you any good. It's doing you damage. It's actually reinforcing negative things in your life. So Jesus said that hypocrites love to pray. So it's not only people who love God that love to pray. Hypocrites love to pray. Let me say this, that you know the, the Muslims, they have prayer either three or five times a day and that wherever they are, they put their little mat down and they pray. And yet I can guarantee you they are not connecting with God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. They're praying, and they may be more zealous about prayer than you are, but it's not connecting with God. I guarantee you it's not releasing any supernatural power. Well, let me rephrase that. It might be releasing the power of the devil, their religious things that they're going through, and just reinforcing their jihad mentality and their justification for doing all kinds of things. It might be releasing some demonic supernatural power, but it's not releasing God's power. They aren't connecting with God because there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And Acts chapter 4 says that. You have to approach God through Jesus. And we've got Muslims, we've got Buddhists, we've got... You know, I was watching one of our... Uh, testimonies of people, graduates that have gone around the world, and they were in Nepal. And this couple, they were showing pictures of how religious people are. They have these prayer flags up all over Nepal and Tibet by the thousands, and somehow or another think that this is uh, appeasing an angry God. They have these idols, and they show people walking by, and every time they walk by, they have to, you know, kiss their hand and then touch this thing and go through this. And they have prayer wheels that they spin and they think that this is connecting with God. Most people who are watching this program, if you're watching a Christian broadcast, you acknowledge that that's wrong. And yet they're going through all of these motions. It's not doing anything. I'm here to say that a lot of our religious Christian tradition is every bit just as vain as all of these things that they are doing. It's not producing there is a lot of religious tradition. And just as Jesus started, and the very first thing he says, don't be like the hypocrites. They love to pray. I'm telling you that even among Christians, there are a lot of attitudes and a lot of traditions we have about prayer that may look good, but it's just hypocritical. It is not producing any results. You know, this book that I've got on this, the actual people who published this, this very first chapter in here just goes into depth talking about a, and identifying a lot of religious traditions. And many of the people who were friends with the publisher, they got so incensed that they contacted this publisher and said, you need to quit publishing Andrew Womack's books, especially this one on prayer. And people got offended. And praise God that my publisher stuck with me and said, just get past the first chapter. And if you'll read the rest of it, it'll actually help you in your prayer life. And so I'm having to say this to you. I'm following Jesus' example, but I know that just halfway through the first day, I've already offended a lot of people. And I'm telling you that this is what Jesus said. This is in red in my Bible. Man, Jesus said, don't be like hypocrites. They love to pray. You know, there's some good friends of mine, Carly and Ashley Teredes. Their daughter is the one who was healed over in England, Hannah Teredes, and she was on her death door at three and a half years old. 
And uh, now she just had her first child. I think she's 19 or 20. And uh, God healed her. And anyway, they've been a part of my ministry. Now they have their own ministry and they're just a blessing. But uh, Ashley told me that one time <laughs> they were at home and their son, it was either Joshua or Zach, I forget which son it was, but they had been up listening to my teaching on a better way to pray. And they listened to it and they came down and they said, Dad, you're a hypocrite. <laughs> and Ashley, it just shocked him. He didn't know what to say. And anyway, the son went back upstairs. Pretty soon he came down and he said, Mom, you're a hypocrite too. And so they got to asking him, what are you saying? And he says, well, I'm listening to Andrew. And he said, hypocrites love to pray and you love to pray, so you must be a hypocrite. This isn't saying that all prayer is hypocritical, but it is saying that hypocrites love to pray. And so Jesus said, don't be as the hypocrites are. And look at this, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of man. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. I think there's a couple of ways you might be able to take this statement about they have their reward. But the way I look at it is that if you are praying for the acclaim of other people, as he talks about, you know, they pray on the street corners and they actually hired people to blow trumpets and draw attention. And if you're doing it to get the praise and the approval of men, then you know what that little pat on the back that they give you and say, man, you're awesome. That's your reward. That's it. You aren't going to be rewarded by God. God doesn't honor prayer that is done for the approval of man. And, you know, I've, I was raised in church. I've been to church who knows how many thousands, tens of thousands of times. I've traveled in ministry and heard so many prayers. And I can guarantee you that there are people that when you're just talking to them in a normal voice, like when I was a kid, I was raised in Texas and everybody had a Texas accent, a Texas twang. But you would ask them to get up to pray and all of a sudden they'd change. And they'd go, our dear most heavenly father. And they would get into these things. And it was always God, like G-A-W-D. And they would just totally change everything. They would use Elizabethan English, thy will be done. Father, we cometh to you today. That's religious. You know why you're doing that? You're doing that for the approval of people. And I'm promising you that does nothing to God. Nothing. Now, I believe that we need to show honor and respect to God, but I guarantee you, God wants you to be real with Him. And He's saying right here, Jesus, He's God manifest in the flesh. And people were asking Him, how do we approach God? And He's telling you, He just wants you to be real. He doesn't want you to come and think that you'll be heard for your much speaking. That's what it goes on to say in the next verse. It says, but thou when thou prayest, it says, enter into thy closet, and when thou shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which is in secret shall reward thee openly. You know, this isn't saying that you literally have to enter into a closet. The point that's being made is you don't need to pray for a show. You don't need to pray in front of people. You just need to go. It's about your personal relationship with God. And I'm telling you, there's a lot of things that we do, I believe, that is offensive to God. You can go to many scriptures in the Old Testament where the Lord commanded sacrifices. So blood sacrifices and meal sacrifices and meat offerings and all these things, they were prescribed in the Old Testament. They were things that God told people to do. And yet there are scriptures that says, away with your sacrifices. They're a stink in my nostril. So they were doing things that God told them to do, but it was the attitude that they did it with. They were doing it out of a hypocritical attitude. They were living completely contrary to God, but then still going through the motions of somehow or another pleasing God. And it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that if you give all of your goods to feed the poor, if you give your body to be burned, and if you don't do it motivated by charity, God's kind of love, it profits you nothing. God is more into your motives than he is into the actual things that you're doing. So yes, prayer is important. God wants to hear your prayers. God wants to have a relationship with you. But if you're doing it uh, just to please man, if you change your whole personality, if your vocabulary has to change, and all of a sudden you get to saying things that are completely contrary to who you really are, you're just religious. I'm not saying that to hurt you. 
I'm saying it to enlighten you. God wants you to just be real with Him. Now, that doesn't mean that you just sit there and throw out all of your unbelief. We need to approach God in faith, and I'm going to be teaching on a lot of these things, but He doesn't want you to be religious. And I tell you, it's a turnoff to me when I hear people praying these old religious prayers. And when people start praying like that, I guarantee you, it tells me a lot about their relationship with the Lord or lack thereof. Because if you have a good relationship with the Lord, you aren't going to be religious when you pray. You aren't going to change your whole vocabulary. You don't have to get on your knees. You don't have to bow your head and fold your eyes. You can do any of those things uh, if it's just coming out of your heart. But I'm saying so many people have these religious forms. They go through a rosary and think that that's prayer. I know I'll offend a lot of people but I, that's just religious. And he, in the next verse, goes on to talk about this very thing about vain repetition. I'm running short of time on, on today's program. But, but all of these things, before you can begin to pray and really connect with the Lord and see the results that He wants, you got to do what Jesus said right here, and you got to start uh, tearing up, plucking up all of these wrong doctrine and these religious traditions that we have. You know, would to God that you were just a clean slate and I could just start teaching about prayer and about how God loves you and how you could relate to Him. But the sad fact is most of us have so much stuff written on our heart that I've got to erase some of this stuff and get rid of it before I can write on it the things that the Lord really says. So I hope that this uh, hasn't offended you so much that you won't listen. Man, you need to get this. I promise you, it could change your relationship with God. I've got this free little booklet. It's only about 60 pages that I've written. We're offering this absolutely free to everyone. But then I also have a book. This also is basically free. It's just for a suggested donation. We're asking you to give something, but we will send it to you regardless of what you send. And then we have CDs, DVDs. Uh, we have USBs, and we've got a study guide. The study guide is the same material that's in the book. It's just reformatted so that you can go into greater depth and specifically so that you can teach other people through a Bible study or a Sunday school class or something like this. And I promise you, this would be a great subject for you to uh, study. It would cause a lot of discussion. So listen to our announcer as he gives all of this material, and please call or write today. All right, so in the name of Jesus, here we go. One, two, three. We have officially broke ground. Praise God. Thanks to the support of our friends and partners, Andrew has continued the expansion of our Karis Bible College campus so that we can raise up more disciples to take the gospel further and deeper than ever before. Because you play such an important role in raising up this next generation, Andrew has decided to give monthly construction updates so that you can see the progress of what your giving and prayers have produced. Visit awmi.net slash Karis Campus to see our most recent update today. I'd like to encourage you to check out our AWM Now stories and also our Inside Story. These are things where we just go behind the scenes and show you things about people in the ministry, about things that the ministry is doing that you'll probably never see on television, and yet it is awesome. God is touching people's lives all around the world. And so you can go to awmi.net and check out the AWM Now stories and also our inside stories. They'd be a blessing to you. I'm pleased to announce that we now have my television program translated into Spanish. We have a lot of my materials available in Spanish, but let your friends know that we're now broadcasting our daily program in Spanish. I tell you, I'm excited. God is going to do something special during these meetings. I am enjoying this conference so much, I literally cannot wipe the smile off my face. Seeing Andrew is great, and being able to meet him was awesome. He speaks into your life like no one I know. I mean, he makes the Word come alive. Andrew's teaching and the love that he has for God's Word and truth, it is the gospel truth.
Andrew is offering his booklet, A Better Way to Pray, as his free gift to you today. This booklet is available in English or Spanish and is limited to one free booklet per household. This offer is available in the U.S., U.K., Canada, and Australia. Contact us today to receive your free booklet. Andrew's complete series, A Better Way to Pray, is available in a book and study guide in either English or Spanish. Or you can get this teaching in a newly updated CD or DVD album or as a USB made from our daily television broadcast. Each of these valuable resources is available for a gift of any amount when you contact us. Andrew is also offering this teaching as an audiobook on CD or it can be purchased through audible.com. This entire series is also available for audio download absolutely free from our website. We also want to remind you of Andrew's Living Commentary software. The Living Commentary includes more than 50 years of Andrew's Bible study notes and personal encounters with God. Get Andrew's Living Commentary today for $120. We want to say a special thank you to the Grace Partners of Andrew Womack Ministries. Your gifts make it possible to put free ministry materials into the hands of many people in need. If you're not already a Grace Partner, we ask you to pray about becoming one today. You can become a Grace Partner through our website at awmi.net. While there, you can discover more product details and download additional free resources. You can also order resources or receive prayer by calling our helpline at 719-635-1111. Our helpline is open 24 hours a day, seven days. And this is a brand new little booklet that I just wrote about a month ago. And this is a brief introduction, just a 60 page introduction to this teaching. Now I have a a book that I've had out for a long time. We do ask for a donation towards this, but it's just a suggested donation, anything you send. And I'd encourage you to get the whole thing. We also have USBs that has audio and video. We've got CDs. We've got DVDs that were taken from our program. We've got study guides. I've got a lot of material on this. But I really encourage you to get this. And this little introduction, this would be a great thing just to have to share with somebody else. It's not the full teaching. It's just a summary of it. But this teaching on a better way to pray is something that uh, people either love it or hate it. But I guarantee you, you will not be neutral after you hear this. Because the very first thing I did on yesterday's program, I started countering some of the wrong concepts about it. Jesus said in Mark chapter 7, verse 13, that your traditions and doctrines men make the Word of God of none effect. I could say it this way, that your traditions and doctrines of men about prayer has made your prayers of none effect. I believe that there's a lot of people that honestly, they pray, but they don't see much results from it. And a lot of it is because we have so much religious concepts about prayer. These are like sacred cows that you just can't touch. And yet it's not what Jesus taught. When Jesus started teaching on prayer in Matthew chapter 6, I read some of these verses yesterday, but he said in verse 5, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray. Hypocrites love to pray. And I guarantee you, hypocrites are not connecting with God, and they are not getting their prayers answered. So before we can start talking about what true prayer is, we got to talk about what prayer is not. And he goes on to say in verse 5, it says that they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the centers of the corners of the street that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. And so much of prayer is about being approved by people. I've listened to so many people pray, and when they pray, they aren't praying to God. They're praying to the people. They're praying in a way that they want to receive recognition. And not only public prayer, but there's a lot of people that boast about their private prayer, and they're they're praying to somehow or another soothe their conscience to think that somehow or another, now I deserve an answer from God because I've spent so much time in prayer, or they pray so that they can brag to other people about it. 
You know, I had a man come to my office one time, and Larry Lee, I know many of you wouldn't know this. You you don't have this history, but Larry Lee came out with a teaching. I couldn't even tell you, but it's probably 40 years ago, 30 or 40 years ago. And it was entitled, Could You Not Tarry One Hour? And it's based on Mark Matthew chapter 6, beginning with verse 9, in what we call typically the Lord's Prayer. And so he used the Lord's Prayer kind of as markers if you were running a race and you start off with our Father which art in heaven and he taught about how you spend so much time doing this. And the whole point of it was these were like signposts and if you would spend so much time on our Father which art in heaven and then hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. The whole point was to get you to pray one hour. Now I'm not saying that that's wrong in itself, but one of the guys from his church uh, he, he trained people in this and then they came out and they would go around the country teaching on prayer. And I tell you, there was a time in the body of Christ, which I know many people watching this program, uh, you don't remember this, you weren't seeking the Lord, you might have lived in another country because our program's seen all around the world. But there's many of you don't remember this, but back in the 80s and 90s, I guarantee you there was a prayer movement that was big. And one of them was this teaching on could you not tarry one hour. So a man came to the Colorado Springs area. He was in a local church teaching on how to pray one hour every day. And anyway, he wanted to come see me. So I said, yes. And he came to my office. And the very first thing he did was walk in and say, how much, do you, how much time do you spend in prayer every day? And did you know when he said that, I just thought, what? Why would you want to know this? And my first thought is he's wanting to compare himself with me and probably he, he thought he would come out ahead and it'd make him feel a little better about himself or either he was doing it so that he could come against me and tell me that I need to improve or I just couldn't think of a good purpose in that. But before I could even answer, you know, the Lord just spoke to me and he said, how much time did you spend with Jamie? That's my wife yesterday. And the truth was that the day before that, I had spent the entire day with her. Now, that didn't mean that we were talking uh, nonstop, you know, 12 hours a day or something like that, but I was with her. We talked back and forth all day long. And the Lord just spoke to me before I could even think to answer him that I spent all day with Jamie. And if God never leaves us nor forsakes us, he's always with us then if you could reduce your prayer life down to an hour a day that you spent in prayer, you got a poor relationship with God because He was with you 24 hours a day, and yet you only spent an hour or 30 minutes or an hour praying. See, this is just contrary to the way most people think. Most people really live their life pretty much on their own. It's a secular life, but they'll have a devotion time or a prayer time where they focus on God. And I would say that that's better than having no time where you're focused on God. But man, that's not what God, the Lord wants. He wants to have relationship with you constantly. And I'll be teaching about this a lot more as we go through this. But you know now, it's like over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, it says, pray without ceasing. I think there's multiple ways you can take that, that when you pray for something, you just don't quit until you see the manifestation because you need to persevere and continue in prayer. But I think you could also take it that you just pray all of the time. Honestly, there I pray all of the time. You know, I got up at 5 o'clock this morning, but I woke up at 4 o'clock, and I laid there, and during that 4 to 5 o'clock, I was just praying and praising the Lord. When I go to sleep, I'm talking to the Lord. When I go to sleep, I go to sleep thinking about the Lord, praying about the Lord. Uh, during the night, I dream, and I'd say 90% of all of my dreams, I'm worshiping the Lord, God's speaking to me, I'm dreaming about things. When I'm awake during the day, when I drive down the road, I'm just constantly talking to the Lord. Very seldom do I have a time where I've got my eyes closed, my hands folded, I'm on my knees. I've done all of those things. I, I would do it again. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that, but the vast majority of my prayer time with the Lord is just communion with the Lord. It's conversational prayer. Now, there are times that I've got someone that I'm praying for or something that is specifically coming against me that just demands that, man, I put aside everything else and focus exclusively 
on that. I've got to deal with this situation. So I may spend an entire day, two, three days, fasting and praying and seeking the Lord about something. There are times that I'll go out and most of the time this is when I'm out walking, but I will spend an hour or two hours praying in tongues and just focused on the Lord, building myself up. So I have special times, but the vast majority of the times I'm just fellowshipping with the Lord. And so if you can sit there and say, well, I spend 30 minutes a day praying in tongues or something like that. And if you can reduce your prayer time to something like that, I think you are really missing out on what prayer really is. Again, am I saying that you never have a time like that? No, that's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that it's not these religious things where you have a religious part of your life and you have a devotion or a an hour of prayer, and then the rest of your time, you're just as carnal as you can possibly be. You are on your own, and you're doing your own thing, and you're watching movies and reading books and listening to music that totally take your mind and your heart away from God. But boy, you have this certain time. You know, again, I mentioned this yesterday, but when I first got really turned on to the Lord, I heard people say that you ought to spend an hour a day in prayer. And I thought if an hour a day was good, two hours, three hours was better. And I would spend a minimum of a couple of hours a day. This is before I got married. And I would just spend a couple of hours per day praying. Sometimes I'd pray four and five hours. And I actually set a timer because the first time that I decided I was going to spend an hour in prayer, man, I started praying and after, you know, I I thought, well, it must be at least 30 minutes. And I looked over at the clock and I had gone like five minutes. And it just seemed like that hour to spend an hour just specifically focused and talking to the Lord. Man, it was hard. And I had to set a timer and I started spending an hour or two a day praying in tongues. And I remember one morning I got up early and I was studying the word. And I don't remember where I was or or the details, but I remember that, man, the Lord was speaking to me through the Word. I was seeing things that I hadn't seen before, and I was really enjoying it, and I was was excited. I was getting blessed, and I looked over at the clock, and it was about 15 minutes until that prayer time. And I just, I was so discouraged, like, oh, God, I'm so sorry. I've got to go pray to you. And I felt bad about it, but I knew that the Lord knew what I was thinking. So I just started praying right then. I said, God, I'm sorry. But I said, the truth is I go to dreading this prayer time because it just seems like it takes forever. And I said, right now I'm studying the word and God was speaking to me and I was receiving. And I said, I love what I'm doing right here. And I said, I hate to admit it, but I just dread this prayer time about 15 minutes before it starts. And as I was talking to the Lord and telling him that, he says, don't feel bad, Andrew. He says, I dread it 30 minutes before (laughs) prayer time. And it just dawned on me, if I dreaded that prayer time, if it was like pulling teeth, if it was just a religious form that I was going through, and if I didn't like it, and if God didn't like it, then why was I doing it? And you know what? I remember I just decided I'm going to keep studying the Word. And I was, I was in communion with the Lord. When I read the Word, I don't always pray and say, Oh, God, speak to me and open up my heart and reveal things to me. I don't always pray that, but that's always my attitude. And when I read the Word, I'm not reading it with my head. I'm reading it with my heart. I don't know if you connect with that. But there there is a difference. The Word of God's not written to your head. You have to use your head to know how to read and get the information, but you have to perceive the Word with your heart. So when I'm reading the Word, I'm, I'm in prayer. The entire time I'm reading the Bible because I'm reading and I'm saying, Father, thank you for showing me things. And God speaks to me, just like these verses right here. There are many of you that have read through these verses hundreds of times, but you have never connected that hypocrites love to pray. You just somehow or another skip through that. You know, if you would open up your heart, God would speak to you and show you things in your life that may just be religious form, hypocritical, traditions and doctrines of men that make the word of none effect. And if you'll read with your heart, he'll speak to you and tell you it's not about doing things to be approved of men. It's not about using Elizabethan English. It's just about communing with the Lord. 
You know, I see these people that pray in front of the Congress and they pray at some gathering where there's lots of people and all of these things. And nearly every time they will have a written prayer. I'm not saying that a written prayer cannot be genuine and from the heart. But again, I just, I can't read a prayer that I have put together with my mind. When I pray and talk to the Lord, I'm talking from my heart and it may not be uh, hermeneutical. It may not be exactly the way it's supposed to be. But man, I believe that God hears a prayer from your heart more than all of the religious stuff that we go through. The next verse, this is Matthew 6, 6. It says, But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. This goes with the previous verse about people that were standing on the street corners and praying in a loud voice so that everybody could hear them. The point that's being made is don't pray for the approval of people. Don't pray to grab their attention. Don't go and say, how much do you pray so that you can feel better about yourself and feel like you're doing more than somebody else. No, prayer is about a personal relationship with God, and it's not about getting that pat on the back. If that's what you're after, if you're after the approval of man, if you want people to talk about, man, your prayer was awesome, then that's all you're going to get out of it. You need to be praying from your heart. And, you know, I actually had a uh, youth director in our Baptist church. He was not very spiritual. He was not a very good youth director. And this was right after I got really turned on to the Lord. And I was so excited about the Lord, it was contagious, and it affected our whole youth group. And so we would meet together in the morning, and we would pray for an hour before we went to uh, school. And we would all pray together. And anyway, this guy came against us because he was not spiritual. We were in love with the Lord. We weren't just swallowing everything. He wasn't controlling it. And anyway, he used this verse to come against us and said, you shouldn't pray in public. You ought to enter into your closet. This is wrong for you to gather together with other people and pray. Did you know Jesus is the one who spoke this? And Jesus prayed in public many, many times. This is not saying that you don't pray in public, that you don't have a prayer partner and that you don't pray with someone, but it's saying that you shouldn't be praying to impress other people. You ought to be talking directly to God. And when I hear a person all of a sudden change their voice, change their whole mannerism, they start speaking in Elizabethan English, they start saying things that are completely contrary to the way that they are, and stuff, then I know that they're praying for my benefit or for somebody else's benefit. They aren't praying to God. And you know, it's not only related to prayer, but I tell our students in our Bible school the same thing, that if you are like this normally, but when you get behind a pulpit, all of a sudden you've got to start screaming and yelling and you've got to say glory to God, duh, and you got to put it in it to religious form, and you got to do this sing-song preaching and things like this. And if that's the way that you are, then you're a hypocrite. I believe you ought to be supernaturally natural. Now, that's not to say that if a person is a great extrovert and if they're dramatic, and if that's who they are naturally, well, then they can be dramatic when they're in the pulpit. But you just need to be supernaturally natural. I don't know how many of you would know R.W. Schambach, but uh, he's, he's been gone to be with the Lord quite a while, and I guarantee you he was on radio, and R.W. Sandbach was dramatic. He would scream and yell. He had a hoarse voice because he was always screaming. And some people could say, well, that's just religious. But, you know, I held a meeting with R.W. Sandbach, and my wife and my mother, we all got in his convertible, and we went out for some ice cream. And I tell you, when he was driving down the road, he was exactly the way he was behind the pulpit. He was, he was a character, and he would just scream and yell. We went into a restaurant, and he was exactly the same sitting at the table. That was just him. So if that's the way that you are outside of the pulpit, well, then, man, be dramatic. Be, uh, you know, all of the extrovert when you're in the pulpit, but for you to be this little mousy person and then you get behind the pulpit and all of a sudden you start speaking with a booming voice and your whole mannerisms change and all of this stuff, you're just religious. You know, one of the things that really blessed me when I first got started 
in ministry. I was ministering in uh, Pritchett, Colorado, and actually I got kicked out of that church within six months. We saw a man raised from the dead and people started coming. They had 12 people in the church, but after we saw a man raised from the dead, they started coming from all over and we were having over a hundred people in the church and those 12 people didn't like it because they came from outside of Pritchett and they were prejudiced and didn't want people to come. So anyway, I only lasted six months and I started traveling a circuit in uh, Oklahoma, Colorado, and New Mexico. And I would travel a circuit and do Bible studies I did six Bible studies a night. And I was going out to these little ranchers' homes. One guy that we went to, you had to drive a mile through a creek bed to get to his house. There wasn't a road. You had to literally drive through a creek bed. He didn't have electricity, didn't have plumbing. Now, he had put plumbing in, but I mean, he didn't have city plumbing. Uh, he had a big tank that he had put water in. He drilled a well. and So he had running water. He had a generator, but he... He was so far out, there weren't any city facilities. And when we got to his house, there'd be 60 people there for a Bible study. They would come from 100 miles away. But my point in bringing this up is to say that these were just ranchers. They were cattlemen, and they didn't have a religious bone in them. Most of them had never gone to church because, or the few times they went to church, they saw all of the hypocrites. They saw people that were living one way, but when they got to church, they had these holy mannerisms, and they were just turned off by the hypocrisy. And so I started going in these Bible studies and going out to these remote places, and these ranchers, man, we didn't, I didn't stand up. I didn't have a pulpit. We sat down. There would be 50 or 60 of us, and we'd just sit there, and I'd share the Word with them. Sometimes we would sing, but we didn't have a, a song service as such. We would sing when it was spontaneous. We didn't pass a bucket and yet, did you know that I had over $6,000 a month coming in? People would just stick it in my pocket. They'd stick it in my Bible. They'd put, uh, you know, fresh milk that they had just milked the cow and put it in our car. We were having two and three gallons of milk a week. We had a side of beef and, and all kinds. They were givers, but it was non-religious. And it was good for me to just sit there and just be sharing the Word, just like I'm sharing with you right now. And I remember this one guy came and I told him he could travel with me and minister, but he was into preaching. He had to stand up. He had to have a pulpit. He built a little thing. He had to have everybody stand up and sing and then sit down and then stand up. And it was just not going over well with all of these ranchers. And I remember he was trying to be real dramatic and he made some great point and he goes like, ta-da, like that. And a kid came running and opened the door and hit him in the back of the head and knocked him on the floor. He had a dog come up that peed on his foot <laughs> and it just threw him off. He could not handle it. And I was loving it because he, he just had to have this religious thing. But man, I was seeing people born again. I saw miracles happen, blind eyes open. We saw people raised from the dead and we did it without all of this religious stuff. And I believe that that was so good for me to just train me to just be real, to just sit down and share the Word. It didn't matter if it's with one person or if it's with a hundred people. I was just talking to them. You know, this is the way our television program is. And when we first went on 23 years ago, there was not a single person on television that I knew of that sat and just shared the Word. They were all behind the purpose pulpit, three-piece suit. They were dramatic. They were doing all of these things. They had to have an organ playing behind them. And I had people pass up my program because it wasn't the religious form. But then in another way, people would stop and watch my program because they'd never seen anybody just sit down and talk like a normal person. And it drew people to the ministry. This is what I believe that the Lord is saying right here is don't be hypocritical, even, not only in your church service and in front of people, but in your personal relationship with God. Just be real. Go into your closet. It's just you and God and just talk to Him like He's a real person. He's a holy, almighty, uh, eternal person, but He is a person and He is not religious. And I tell you, His, your religious stuff doesn't do a thing to impress God. So anyway, we're just getting started, but I'm talking about a better way to pray, and I've got this little booklet. It's about a 60-page booklet, 
that I wrote, and this is an absolute free offer to you. I'll give it to anybody who asks for it. We also have a book in English and in Spanish on a better way to pray. This is a lot more detailed. And then I have CDs, DVDs, study guide, and a USB that will have audio and video on it. And I encourage you to please get this teaching. I think it'll help you. So listen to our announcer and call or write today. Our partners have recently enabled us to start producing my television programs in Spanish. I think this is going to be a big help. It's going to reach a number of people. Spanish is the second most spoken language in the world, and I'm excited about this opportunity. If you haven't yet become a partner and been a part of helping us do this, I encourage you to do so. Praise God. We are going to share the gospel in Spanish around the world. Andrew is offering his booklet, A Better Way to Pray, as his free gift to you today. This booklet is available in English or Spanish and is limited to one free booklet per household. This offer is available in the U.S., U.K., Canada, and Australia. Contact us today to receive your free booklet. Andrew's complete series, A Better Way to Pray, is available in a book and study guide in either English or Spanish or you can get this teaching in a newly updated CD or DVD album or as a USB made from our daily television broadcast. Each of these valuable resources is available for a gift of any amount when you contact us. Andrew is also offering this teaching as an audiobook on CD or it can be purchased through audible.com. This entire series is also available for audio download absolutely free from our website. We also want to remind you of Andrew's Living Commentary software. The Living Commentary includes more than 50 years of Andrew's Bible study notes and personal encounters with God. Get Andrew's Living Commentary today for $120. We want to say a special thank you to the Grace Partners of Andrew Womack Ministries. Your gifts make it possible to put free ministry materials into the hands of many people in need. If you're not already a Grace Partner, we ask you to pray about becoming one today. You can become a Grace Partner through our website at awmi.net. While there, you can discover more product details and download additional free resources. You can also order resources or receive prayer by calling our helpline at 719-635-1111. Our helpline is open 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. To write us, use the address on your screen. We appreciate your generosity and hope to hear from you today. We'd like to point out Andrew's upcoming speaking schedule. Mark your calendars to come meet Andrew at one of these events and let the Word of God transform your life. In the month of April, Andrew will be hosting a live stream to Poland. Also in April, join Andrew and guest speaker Bishop E.W. Jackson for the Chicago Gospel Truth Conference in Lombard, Illinois. Then join Andrew at The Cure in Woodland Park. Lastly, in April, Andrew will be speaking in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. For more details on Andrew's next meeting in your area, visit our website at awmi.net. Before you were even formed in your mother's womb, God already had determined a purpose for your life a God-given purpose. God has a purpose to train you in what you're called to do, and I tell you, Karis Bible College is the place for that. Man, if you want a life change, come to Karis. Come on to Karis! The next two to three years could be the most powerful time of your life. If you sit under the Word for four hours a day, for five days a week, for two or three years, I guarantee you, you are going to have God speak to you and start revealing purpose to you. Every one of you are created for a purpose.
power of the words. It feeds me so much, I want more. I'm discovering who I am. We want people to know what we know. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Wednesday's broadcast of The Gospel Truth. This week, I'm teaching a series entitled, A Better Way to Pray. I wrote this little booklet just a month or two ago entitled, Introduction to a Better Way to Pray. And so this is just a brief summary of this teaching on prayer. And I mean, it's brief compared to the major book that I've got out. I had this book out many years ago. And this, uh, I forget exactly how many pages this is. It's a, it's a 200 page book and it goes into a lot more detail. We have it in English and Spanish, and then we have CDs, DVDs, study guides, and a USB that has the audio and the video on it. But I specifically wrote this just for people uh, that wouldn't go to the effort of getting the book, any of the other materials, and this is my free gift to any person who would like to have it, and I promise you, this would be a blessing to you. If you've heard the first two days, I'm taking the same approach on teaching about prayer that Jesus took when he was in Matthew chapter 6. He started by coming against the religious concepts, misconcept, misconceptions about prayer. You know, the scribes and the Pharisees of Jesus' day were very religious. They wore phylacteries, which that goes back to Proverbs, or excuse me, to Deuteronomy chapter 6, where it says, This book of the law shall not depart from your eyes. You have to keep it before your eyes day and night. So what they did, they took this strip of uh, leather and put it around their head, and they dangled a little pouch in front of their eyes, and they put passages of Scripture in there to literally try and fulfill what Deuteronomy chapter 6 said. And they would walk around with these phylacteries. They had all kinds of religious things that they were going through. But man, the scribes and the Pharisees, the lawyers, the scribes were the only people that Jesus ever rebuked. Matthew chapter 23, the whole chapter is you scribes, you Pharisees, you hypocrites, you whited sepulchers, you snakes, you vipers. He rebuked them. He didn't rebuke the harlots. He didn't rebuke all of the other people. He didn't approve of their lifestyle. He told the woman in the eighth chapter of the book of John who had been taken in the very act of adultery, he says, go and sin no more. He called it sin, but he didn't condemn them. He extended mercy towards people except hypocrites. Hypocrites received his strongest rebukes. And when he started teaching on prayer, he said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 5, and when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. A little pat on the back, that's their reward. That's it. They aren't getting anything from God. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, Pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. The first two days of this week I've spent on these two verses, and I could still go back and talk about it because we've got so much hypocritical religious stuff. People just become a brand new person, a totally different person when they pray. That's a hypocrite. Did you know that the word hypocrite literally comes from back in uh, the Roman days and they would have actors and they would put up a mask. They would have it on like a stick and they would hold this mask in front of them and an actor would literally change masks. Like they'd put up one mask and act like one character and then they'd change. And so the word hypocrite literally means from behind the mask. And it was talking about an actor that you were just putting on an act. You now are you are now a religious person and you are praying in an Elizabethan voice and you say God instead of God and you, you're you a hypocrite. I love you. God loves you. I'm not against you, but I'm saying that that does not please God. Jesus is saying, don't be that way. He goes on to say in the next verse, in verse 7, but when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Did you know I could say that, I would, I would say that most Christians today think that they will be heard for their much speaking. This is just as prevalent today in the church as it was 
in the day that Jesus was there. People think that, man, it's how long you pray. Did you know some of the greatest prayers in the Bible are short prayers? Man, Jesus, he just said, come forth to Lazarus with a loud voice. When he stilled the storm, be still. He would say, be healed. Did you know a great prayer is help? That's a great prayer. You look at Jesus, his prayers were short. Now, he prayed all night long, but did you know if you, the book, uh, the Bible, the, four, the Gospels are four different writers commenting on the life of Jesus. And so when you read the Gospels, it may look like Jesus spent lots of nights in prayer. But if you look at it chronologically and, and don't duplicate one writer writing about the same thing that another did, there's only twice in Jesus' ministry, three and a half years of his ministry that he spent all night in prayer. One was before he called his disciples and he was praying to receive revelation. And then he prayed before his crucifixion. But he, Jesus didn't spend all night in prayer all the time. There's many times that it mentions that he would go up early and pray. And so I'm not saying Jesus didn't pray, but I'm saying that, you know, there's just a lot of people that think you have to spend huge amounts of time in prayer. And I'm going to be teaching on this more. I'm just mentioning it now. But prayer really should be just communion with God, not necessarily formal. There's times that you are in a crisis and boy, you just have to set aside everything else and get before God and not focus on anything else. But the vast majority of prayer should just be communion with God, just spend, spending time with Him. You know, one of the ways that I knew that God put Jamie and me together. We were engaged to be married before we ever held hands. And uh, it's supernatural how God put us together. I won't go into the whole thing. But one of the ways that I had it confirmed to me that it was God was because of the few times that I dated before Jamie, I was on pins and needles and I had to perform. I felt like I had to always, you know, have something to say. And I, I wasn't at ease. I was performing when I was around any other girl. But when I was with Jamie, it was just like, man, I just... It, when we got married, it took us about two hours to adjust. The second day we were married, we went out to eat with some people and somebody asked how long we had been married and we told them two days and they were shocked. They said, you act like you've been married forever. And we were just at ease. I didn't have to talk around Jamie. We went down to see my relatives, a two or three hour drive. And we talked a lot of the time, but there was times that we were just totally quiet and we had time. We enjoyed being with each other. I didn't have to put on. I didn't have to perform. And sad to say, most people, when it comes to prayer, you're a hypocrite. You're behind the mask. You become a different person. You have to talk differently. You have to, you can't leave a, a blank spot in the conversation. You just, it's like a machine gun. You just all of a sudden open up your mouth and boom, you just start talking. You talk for an hour. It's a total monologue. You don't listen to anything. God didn't speak to you. And it, it's just you talking to yourself. Now, you may be talking to God, and I'm sure that the Lord loves us so much that He responds to that the best He can. But I think it ought to be like, you know, when we were using a CB or something, some of the old walkie-talkies and stuff that you ought to every once in a while say over and give God a chance to say something. I had a pastor friend that I used to pray with, and when I prayed with this guy, he came out of the Pentecostal realm, and I mean this guy would scream and shout and walk back and forth and hit the wall, and it, it was just like a machine gun, just brrr, He would talk for 45 minutes without a breath, and one time we were out jogging together and he says, you know, I don't know why the Lord doesn't talk to me when I'm praying. He says, it's always when I'm in the shower or when I'm doing something else is when God talks to me. He says, I just don't understand why he doesn't talk to me while I'm praying. And I was able to tell him, I said, it's because God can't get a word in edgewise. You have your prayer list. You have all of these things. You've got your formulas and you go through and you just are constantly talking to God and you never give God an opportunity to talk to you. You know, prayer ought to be communion. It ought to be a conversation, not a monologue. I know that I'm 
popping a lot of people's bubbles. But on the other hand, there's a lot of people watching this that are thinking, yes, because the way you're doing it, it's just not good. You know, if you came in to see me, and if you wanted a meeting with me, say you had some problem and you wanted my counsel or something, and so you come in and I schedule 30 minutes, and if you came in and just walked in, and if you started talking, and if you never took a breath, and if all you did was talk, 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 and then when you get through, you know, I'm glad I spent this time with you, and then you get up and leave, I would wonder why in the world you even wanted to come talk to me. You didn't get any input from me. You didn't, you didn't receive any of my counsel. You didn't give me an opportunity. And sad to say, this is what most of prayer is. This is what most of prayer is. If the Lord wanted to say something to you, He couldn't get it in. This is not what He's talking about. So again, He said, don't use vain repetitions. Again, I've, I mentioned this earlier, but we've got some video that we showed some of our graduates that went to Nepal and people have these prayer wheels and these idols and they walk down the road just kissing every little thing and they have flags up and they think that that's prayer. That is absolutely useless. That does not do anything. And when you are just using vain repetitions, when you're using a rosary, I'm not saying that somebody couldn't be blessed by a rosary, but I'm saying 99.9% .9 of all people, it's just a religious form and you're using vain repetitions. The priest will tell you, you got to say so many Hail Marys and so many Our Fathers, and you just go through the formula and do that. That is useless. Again, somebody who's desperate, God might be able to break through your religious tradition and reach you in something, but it would be the exception rather than the rule. And also, you know, later right here in verse 9, it starts into the, what people call the Lord's Prayer. I think it's actually more accurate to call it a model prayer because this isn't a New Testament prayer. All of the New Testament prayers in uh, John chapter 16, Jesus said, Now, whatever you ask in my name, I'll give it unto you. Prior to this time, you haven't asked anything in my name. Ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. So this isn't in the name of Jesus. This is before Jesus died and put the new covenant into effect. So this isn't even a New Testament prayer. I, it's not prayed in the name of Jesus. But it does contain all of the elements that we need in prayer. And I'll deal with that more in just a little bit. But I was relating this to the fact that I have been around people, especially when I go to casting demons out of people. I've seen some weird things happen. I had one time in Colorado Springs that I had my eyes closed and I had my hands on somebody and I was praying for him and I didn't know this, but Jamie told me later that this guy was demon possessed and I was commanding those demons to come out of him and he was trying to hit me and he couldn't do it. He'd get this close and he'd just stop. He, he was swinging, but he couldn't hit me. I had my eyes closed. I missed the whole thing. But when I pray for people and cast demons out, I've seen some strange things happen. And I remember this one woman was uh, in the line. And when this demon manifested and started screaming and things happening, this woman started repeating the Lord's Prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed it be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day. And boy, she was, just, she was quoting it just as fast as she could. Did you know I actually... I uh, told her, I said, now, shut up. I said, be quiet. And I'm sure a lot of people would be shocked. Well, what's wrong with that? Well, just reciting something, vain repetitions doesn't do anything. I guarantee you, she wasn't praying in faith. She was praying in total fear. She was panicked. And she was using this kind of like an amulet or something that would ward off the devil. It reminds me of the vampire movies where, you know, the vampire comes, but if you'll hold up a Bible or a cross, they would just uh, shriek back in fear. I guarantee that is just stupid. The devil is not going to flee at a cross or at a Bible. He translated some of the Bibles that we have today. I guarantee you, it's not just all of the formulas. It's not these religious things. It's from the heart. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 says that if you have the, 
uh, tongues of men and of angels, and you don't speak by love, it profits you nothing. If you have prophecy, if you have faith so that you could remove mountains, but you don't have love, it profits you nothing. If you give your body to be burned or all of your goods to feed the poor and don't do it motivated by love, it profits you nothing. God is looking at your heart. First Samuel 16, 7, uh, the Lord told Samuel, who came to anoint a king, and he looked at all of David's brothers, and he saw Eliab, the biggest and the strongest, and the Lord said, don't look on his outer appearance, because I don't see the way that people see. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. God is looking at your heart. And I don't care if you're reciting the Lord's Prayer, if you're doing it out of fear, if you're doing it out of just religious habit, and this is what you go through, but your mind is somewhere else and you aren't even thinking about the Lord, it does no good at all. Matter of fact, I believe it does uh, damage when we just go through the religious motions because what you're doing, you, your heart's not into it. You don't mean it from your heart. You're doing all of these religious observances from your head. And what you're doing, you're putting a layer of insensitivity between your heart and God because it's, it's not from the heart. And, and so you're just going through the motions and it's inoculating you against it. You aren't even paying attention to the words that you're saying. You're just going through a formula. That doesn't please God. I know the things that I'm saying are offensive to a lot of people. And some of you are just feeling like I'm coming against religion. Well, I, let me rephrase that. I am coming against religion. I'm not coming against Christianity. What I mean by religion is men's formulas, men's ideas that they come up with. Christianity isn't something that men came up with. It is totally of God. God created a re way to have a relationship with Him through faith in Him. And true Christianity is not a religion like Mo uh, Buddhism or Hinduism or, or the Muslims. It's not a religion where men comes up with their own ideas and they approach God based on what they think it should be. True Christianity is God reaching down to us, not us reaching up to Him. And it's just us responding to Him. And I'm telling you, there is a lot of religion today that is offensive. It's not only offensive to God, but it turns off a lot of people. I've met a lot of people who... Uh, when I start talking about the Lord, immediately a wall goes up because they've been hurt. They've seen hypocrites. I've had people tell me before, says, I'm not going to church where all those hypocrites are. There's a lot of people. Mahatma Gandhi is a guy who was exiled in Africa. And as he was in Africa, he actually read the Bible and was convinced that Jesus was the Messiah. And he went to a church to make a personal profession of faith in Jesus and he went to a Presbyterian church that was run by white missionaries. This was in Africa. And because he was a black man, they wouldn't let him in the church. And Mahatma Gandhi said, I would have been a Christian if I hadn't have met one. Now, I don't doubt that those Presbyterian missionaries were probably born again. I mean, they had to have some relationship with the Lord and commitment to the Lord to leave America, to go to a foreign country and deal with things. I'm not saying they weren't saved, but I can say they didn't represent God properly. God doesn't reject anybody because of the color of their skin. And I guarantee you that was just religious. It's hypocritical. And there are many people like that, that they aren't turned off to God. They're turned off to religion. So when I go to talking to people, often I'll have to sit there and distance myself and begin to tell them, I'm not talking about religion. And they'll, they'll raise up these barriers and talk about things that have happened. And I said, I don't like that either. And the moment I can show them that I'm not religious and that I'm not just approaching them, you know, based on something that has offended them, well, then they'll open up and there's a, there's a desire. Most people know that there's a God and they know it's not them. They know that they need help but they are turned off by all of the religious hypocrites. That's not totally right because if you don't like hypocrites, you sure ought to go to church because hell is going to be full of hypocrites. Amen. And just because you don't like the hypocrites, don't go to hell. It's going to be populated with a lot of hypocrites. Yes, there's hypocrites in church too, but you need to be going and getting hold of the truth in the Word of God. 
And so Jesus is just trying to cut through all of this religious stuff. They thought that they would be heard for their much speaking. You know, you can see in the book of Acts chapter 3 that the Jews had an hour of prayer every single day. It says they went up into the temple at the hour of prayer. They would stop everything during the day and go pray. There's nothing wrong with that at its core, but if it just becomes a tradition, something that you do out of ritual, but it's not coming from your heart, then it's not pleasing to God. And so much of the stuff associated with prayer has just become religious. In verse 8, this is Matthew chapter 6, verse 8, Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what you have need of before you ask Him. Boy, this is, this is huge. If you would take this one truth that Jesus said right here and apply it to your prayer life, it would stop a lot of stuff because the average person comes to God and feels like that prayer is an opportunity to tell misinformed God about what your situation is. And so you've got to tell him how bad it is. And you spend 20, 30 minutes, oh God, the doctor said this, my husband did this. Uh, and you spend, you spend all of your time rehearsing what's wrong and telling God as if he doesn't know. It's like somehow or another you've got to impress on him that, man, this is urgent. I know you've got millions of prayer requests, but put this one to the top of your stack because the doctor says, I'm going to die. I've only got so long to live. God, you've got to do something now. Jesus is saying that, look, your father knows what you need more than you know it. God knows your situation better than you know it. He has a better perspective on it than what you have. Prayer is not an opportunity to inform poor misinformed God about how urgent your situation is and to cry and just to, in a sense, throw up on the Lord. You come with all of your hurt and you just start pouring this out. Now, there is a place to cast your care over on the Lord. I'm not saying that you hide it. I'm not saying that you try and present yourself as a person that doesn't have any problems. But you don't have to give God every gory detail. You know, a friend of mine, um, Charles Caps, he's now gone on to be with the Lord. But I heard Charles Caps one time preaching, and he said he was praying, and in the middle of his prayer, God just interrupted him and said, Charles, what are you doing? And he was shy. He said, well, I'm praying. And God said, you aren't praying, you're complaining. And I, I, I can guarantee you there are millions of people watching this program that your prayer life is nothing but complaining. You are just telling God how bad everything is as if he doesn't know. Again, there is a place to cast your care over in the Lord. I'm not saying that you disguise it, that you hide it, but you don't need to tell God how bad it is as if he doesn't know. He knows you and your situation better than you know it. So what I've done these first three days is just pull the rug out from under most people with the way they pray. And I know that that's unsettling, but sometimes you got to terrify a person before you edify them. Sometimes you got to jackhammer that wrong foundation before you can put in a good foundation. So we're going to start getting into what is prayer, but I think it's important to take this same approach that Jesus did and tell you what prayer is not before we tell you what it is. I wrote this little 60-page booklet. It's a free offer to you. I'd like to give this to every single person. It will summarize a lot of the things we're talking about. And then this book, it's a 200-page book. It'll go into a lot more detail. It's entitled A Better Way to Pray. I've also got CDs, DVDs, study guide, and a USB on this. Our announcer will give you all the information, and please call or write today. I want to let you know that we are giving away a free Keras course. It's the first course that I teach in our curriculum in our Bible college. It's entitled A Sure Foundation, and it's a free course. It's a giveaway that we are giving to people just so that you can sample what Keras Bible College is all about. So you can go to kerascourse.com and you can get this free course that we're offering. It's an eight-hour teaching. I promise you to be a blessing. Check it out. The reason I do what I do is twofold. First of all, God just transformed my life. And it's just like the guy that the Lord told him, he says, don't go tell anybody about what's happened to your daughter. And he, man, couldn't keep it quiet. 
When you get God touching you, you just want to tell somebody. You got this good news you want to tell people. But beyond that, I believe God's got a specific call on my life. And I mean, God has encouraged me thousands of times. And on November the 4th, 2014, he woke me up at three o'clock in the morning and he said, this is the reason that I've raised you up is to change people's opinion of me. And as their opinion of me changes, then they in turn will go change their world. Our partners are essential to everything we do. 53% of the people who write us and contact us don't give a thing, and we send them the material. And the reason that I give my tapes away is because back in the beginning of our ministry when we were in Seagoville, Texas, pastoring our first little church, I just made a promise. I said, God, if you ever show me something that could change another person's life, I'll never deny them access to it because of finances. The initial response that I get from people who come in contact with our ministry is that they just see God in a total different light than they've ever seen Him. That causes them to respond to God. I'd like to give you a special invitation to join me on July the 3rd through the 7th for our Summer Family Bible Conference. This is always one of the highlights of our year. We have things specifically for the youth, for children, for the entire family, and we have a musical production. It's just going to be awesome. Remember July the 3rd through the 7th for our Summer Family Bible Conference. Andrew is offering his booklet, A Better Way to Pray, as his free gift to you today. This booklet is available in English or Spanish and is limited to one free booklet per household. This offer is available in the U.S., U.K., Canada, and Australia. Contact us today to receive your free booklet. Andrew's complete series, A Better Way to Pray, is available in a book and study guide in either English or Spanish or you can get this teaching in a newly updated CD or DVD album or as a USB made from our daily television broadcast. Each of these valuable resources is available for a gift of any amount when you contact us. Andrew is also offering this teaching as an audiobook on CD or it can be purchased through audible.com. This entire series is also available for audio download absolutely free from our website. We want to say a special thank you to the Grace Partners of Andrew Womack Ministries. Your gifts make it possible to put free ministry materials into the hands of many people in need. If you're not already a Grace Partner, we ask you to pray about becoming one today. You can become a Grace Partner through our website at awmi.net. While there, you can discover more product details and download additional free resources. You can also order resources or receive prayer by calling our helpline at 719, celebrating 55 years of ministry. That word that he meditates on day and night w was coming out in his teaching, and it was coming into my heart. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Thursday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. This week I've been teaching on a subject that I've entitled A Better Way to Pray. I wrote this little booklet just a month or two ago, and this is a freebie to you. It's just a 60-page little booklet that will summarize this teaching. And I tell you, if you've watched any of these programs this week, I've countered a lot of religious thinking about prayer. And this would be just great to share with someone. It's not the full teaching. I've got this book. It's about a 200-page book entitled A Better Way to Pray. And I've got it in English and Spanish. I've got study guides, DVDs, and uh, USBs, CDs, and just a lot of different ways. We'll be making that offer at the end of the program today. But I would really like to encourage you to get this. This is the kind of thing that it. this would be good just to refresh yourself with this brief summary. Also, it's a great way to introduce this to other people. And you know, this is either one of the most loved teachings that I do because it just sets people free from all the religious bondage, or it's one of the most hated 
teachings that I've had. I've actually had people who are friends of mine. They're still friends, but they got so upset when I was teaching on this in a meeting that they had been partners with me for over a decade, and they got up and left the meeting. They just could not handle it. And I don't enjoy doing that, but let me, let me say it this way, that most people watching this know that they need to pray. They know that they need to be talking to God, having a relationship with God. And so I would imagine that nearly every person watching this program has some form of prayer. But I have dealt with lots of people. Personally, I've dealt with hundreds, uh, probably over a hundred thousand people personally. I don't know, but lots and lots of people. And I can guarantee you the vast majority of people are not having a successful prayer life. The Bible says that if we ask, we receive. If we seek, we find. If we knock, it's opened unto us. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. And yet that's not the experience of most people watching this. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, that if we ask anything according to His will, we know that He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, then whatsoever we ask, we know we have the petitions that we've desired of Him. Most people have heard that scripture, but that's not their experience. And so most people are praying, but with the average person, it is not successful. And so I'm saying that if what we're doing isn't working, maybe we need to learn something. That's the reason I entitled this teaching A Better Way to Pray. It's not you're of the devil if you don't pray this way. It's not like this is the only way to pray. Everything that I'm countering, I have done, but I'm getting better results now than I ever have. I've seen my son raised from the dead after being in a morgue, uh, in a cooler, stripped naked, dead for over four hours, saw him raised from the dead with no brain damage. I've seen my wife raised from the dead. I've seen blind eyes open, deaf ears open. I've seen miracle after miracle. I'm not saying that I've got it all figured out, but I can guarantee you I am seeing better results than I used to. And if you aren't getting the proper results, maybe you ought to consider that there is a better way to pray. And the reason I'm introducing it this way is because I know what I'm saying is offensive. People don't like change. They don't like to say that the way that their parents taught or prayed and their grandmother and the way that their tradition in their church, I've come against a lot of these things and people don't like it and they take offense when no offense is intended. All I'm trying to do is to uproot all of the junk that keeps us from praying properly. And it's like Jesus said in Matthew, excuse me, Mark chapter 7, verse 13, that uh, your traditions and doctrines of men make the Word of God of none effect. And so before I can effectively deal with what prayer is and the proper way of doing it, I got to counter some of this religious stuff. And that's what Jesus did. This week I've been dealing with Jesus' teaching from Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 8. And uh, man, I could go back and read all of that, but if I do, I won't get very far. Let me go into verse 9. This is Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. And he begins to show us how to pray. And I mentioned this earlier, but instead of this being what is commonly called the Lord's Prayer, and people recite it as this is what they should say, I believe it's more of a model prayer because this prayer doesn't have the name of Jesus in it. And Jesus taught us in John 16, the night before he was crucified, he says, prior to this time, you haven't asked anything in my name, but now ask in my name and you shall receive. And so as New Testament believers, all of our prayers should be based in Jesus' name, the, this prayer right here doesn't have the name of Jesus in it. This is more of a model prayer. It's about how you should approach God. Over in Psalms 100, it says, Enter into His gates with thanksgiving and into His courts with praise. Be thankful unto Him and bless His name, for the Lord is good and His mercy endures forever. And so that's what this prayer is. It tells you, the way He tells you to start in verse 9, after this manner... Therefore pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You know, I could spend probably an entire broadcast on nearly every word in this. This is really important. And there are things, there are elements of prayer that we need to incorporate into our prayer. But it's not the exact words that are important. 
Uh, matter of fact, he said up here, don't think that you'll be heard for your much speaking. He also talked against vain repetitions where you just repeat something over and over. And there's many people that can recite the Lord's Prayer and they don't have a clue what it's talking about. So again, I could go into more detail, but quickly notice it says, after this manner pray ye, our Father. Man, this is radical right here. Did you know under the Old Testament, you didn't call God your Father? Matter of fact, one of the things that the scribes and Pharisees criticized Jesus over was the fact that he said, my Father works this way, and this is the way that I work too. And they called it blasphemy that anybody would call God their Father. Today, we have uh, changed that to such a degree that now it, nearly it's a cliche and a lot of people don't think about it. But this is radical when Jesus said it. To pray and say, Our Father, this is talking about the close personal relationship that God is your Father. He is Almighty. He is the Judge. He is holy. He is all of those things, but He's also your Father. And did you know a child needs to have a relationship with their parent that even though they're the child and they are not in charge, there should be a familiarity that uh, would break down this formalism and stuff. You know, if I was to be in your house, if I was staying with you, and if your child came into the kitchen and I was standing there talking to you and your, your child comes into the kitchen, and if they were to fall down on their face and say, oh, mom, I know I'm not worthy. I know I haven't made my bed. I know I haven't taken out the trash. I know I haven't been the person I'm supposed to be, but I'm thirsty. Could I please have some water? I know I don't. And if your child was to approach you that way, I guarantee you, I would say something is wrong in this family. Something is wrong with this relationship. You can see that in this prayer because when he comes to give us this day our daily bread, that isn't a request. It's a demand. It's a loving demand. It's not a demand because I'm greater in authority and you've got to do what I want, but it shows you a familiarity. And see, this is what he's talking about. When you approach God, Father, He's your Father. He loves you. Yes, He's mighty. Yes, He's holy. He's all of those things. And if we were to just approach Him on the basis of what we have done and what we deserve, we ought to all be ducking because there's nobody that deserves, nobody on our own is worthy. But through Jesus, we can now come boldly before the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Hebrews 4, 16. We should come boldly. You know, if an angel was to try and stop us, I could rebuke an angel because Jesus has given me direct access to the Father. When I say, in the name of Jesus, it's just as if Jesus was approaching. I'm not approaching God based on my own goodness. See, again, I could just keep talking about this, but this is involved. This is what he's saying. When you approach God, do it on the basis of relationship, not just here's a sinner and here's Almighty God. If you have been born again, you need to come before Him as Father, which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. That means that you start giving Him the praise and the honor and the glory. And again, I could expand on this uh, for a long time, but if you would come in and talk about the intimate relationship that has been made available through Jesus, if you were to spend time glorifying Him and giving the worth and the value to God that He deserves, when you got around to saying, oh yeah, Heal me. The doctor says sometimes, by the time you get through magnifying God and showing that He's above everything, it says His name is exalted above every name. That's above the name of cancer, above the name of diabetes, above the name of anything else. If you were to properly magnify Him the way you were supposed to, then when you get to your problem, your problem would seem so small in comparison that it'd be no big deal. But most people just come in. They don't spend any time magnifying God and talking about how awesome He is. They just come in and go straight to their problem. Oh, God, the doctor says this. Oh, God, my body hurts. Oh, God, I'm in desperate need of finances. And you magnify your problem. I've got an entire teaching on this out of Romans chapter 1, verse 21. talks about uh, how to stay full of God. And in that verse, it's one of the things is that you have to magnify God. That's what it says. 
You have to magnify God, and yet most people magnify their problem. You know how you magnify God? You start worshiping Him, and you talk about God. You're a good God. Thank you for what Jesus did for me. And you just spend time entering into His gates with thanksgiving and into His courts with praise. And, you know, like in my situation, I can look back and see that my son was raised from the dead. Total impossible situation. Four and a half hours dead, stripped naked in a cooler with a toe tag on. And he sat up and started talking. I go back and rehearse that. I remember the great things that God has done, how many times he's come through. And as I remember that and enter into his gates with thanksgiving, thanking him for what he's already done, by the time I get to my problem, it's just like this is nothing. This is nothing compared to what God's already done. And if you don't have the history that I do, you can go to the Word of God and you can thank Him. Thank you for what you did with Moses. Thank you for splitting the Red Sea. Thank you for Elijah and Elisha raising people from the dead. Thank you for the way that you came through for David. And you can go to the Word and you can still praise Him and magnify Him. Even if you don't have much of a history with God, you can take what He's done in the Word and use that. But see, if you would enter in and begin to worship Him, thank you for being our Father. Thank you for breaking down the partition and taking away my sin so that I can call you Father, something that was blasphemy under the Old Testament. And I can come in and glorify you. Hallowed be your name and worship you. Then the next thing he says, um, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There is a place for us praying that God's will would be done here on earth the way it is in heaven. You can pray that personally for your own finances, your own relationships, your own healing. You can also pray it uh, for your nation. You can pray it for your family, for your workplace. But there's a place for you praying and believing that God's will will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. If you look over in Galatians chapter 1, verse 4, it says, talking about Jesus, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world, not just the one to come. And so much of Christianity is all about in the sweet by and by. Further along, we'll know all about it. But in the rough now and now, most people are just saved and stuck, and they're singing songs like when we all get to heaven, and that's when they're expecting to start seeing the benefits of their salvation. But Jesus said to pray that His will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. And notice again in Galatians 1, 4, He came to deliver us from this present evil world. You don't need deliverance when you get to heaven. In heaven, there isn't going to be sickness. There isn't going to be crying. There won't be any pain. Heaven's going to be a blast. But right now, we are supposed to pray for God's will to be done here on this earth. Man, that's awesome. And you know what? There are millions of people who are Christians. I'm not saying that you don't have a relationship with the Lord, but you've been taught that really salvation doesn't start until you get to heaven. And so you're just saved and stuck. You're just holding on until the day you go to be with the Lord. It's all pie in the sky, by and by. The truth is you can have steak on the plate while you wait. Amen. God wants you to pray that His will will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. And then He says in verse 11, Give us this day our daily bread. This is what I was referring to earlier. If a child was to come in and start begging, I know I don't deserve it, but please, please, could you give me just a little morsel to eat? I guarantee you that would show that there is a failure in relationship between that child and that parent. I'm not saying that the child should come in and, Mom, you must do what I say. You aren't the boss. I'm not saying that you come in demanding things because you are better. You didn't generate the finances. You didn't buy the groceries and stuff. There should be a humility on your part, but there also ought to be a familiarity like a child coming in and just give me something to eat. Well, you ought to be able to come before God and instead of begging and having to grovel in the dirt and somehow or another do penance before God will answer your prayer, you ought to have such a relationship that you can come and say, Father, thank you for my healing. I take it. 
I've got it. Thank you that by your stripes I was healed. Thank you that you supply all of my need according to your riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Thank you that I am blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And you come in and just reach out and take what God has already made available to you. You know, the things that I'm saying right here are contrary to the way most people pray. Most people come before the Lord as beggars, not as children, taking advantage of what has been made available through love by their parent. But instead, most Christians are coming before God as a beggar. You know, there was a time, and again, I've grown in this. Everything I'm teaching against, I've done. So I'm not condemning anybody, but I found a better way to pray. And when I first got turned on to the Lord and I started in ministry, Jamie and I had just been married and we were having financial problems because I had the wrong conception that if I was in ministry, I was sinning against God if I went and worked a secular job. I thought I had to trust God and get my living only from ministry. That's not true. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but that was a misconception. My heart was right, but my head was wrong. And because of it, Jamie and I were suffering. And we had been days without eating. I mean, days. The only thing that happened, I had a friend come by, and this fr- friend drove a uh, Coca-Cola truck. And he came in and just stopped to see us. And I guess he could tell that we didn't have anything. Or, But he gave us a case of Cokes, and he gave us a bag of Fritos that he was eating, just a small bag of Fritos. And Jamie and I had been doling those things out, one or two Fritos a day, and drinking a Coke with it, and that's all we had had for days. And we had something like 75 cents left. We didn't have enough money to hardly go anywhere. We were just about out of gas, but we needed to have some clothes washed, and so Jamie took the 75 cents, took our dirty clothes, put them in the car, and drove over to the laundromat that was in our apartment complex. It was just a short distance, but rather than carry the clothes, she took the car. So anyway, while she was gone, I was praying, and I was just, God, what's wrong? And again, it was my fault. It wasn't God's fault, but I didn't recognize that at the time. And I was praying and saying, God, I'd give my right arm to feed Jamie. It really bothered me to see Jamie going without food, more than even me going without food. And I was praying and saying, God, I'm... What's wrong? And I was just doing business with God. And in the middle of my prayer, God spoke to me from Luke 12, 32. He brought that scripture to my remembrance. And it says, Fear not, little flock, for it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And all of a sudden I realized I was thinking that God, for some reason or another, had his arms folded like, I don't care. I don't want to give you anything. I thought I had to wring our supply out from God that... I was thinking that God was my problem. And I didn't understand at that time that I was the problem, that I was really the one hindering it. But I got the assurance that God wasn't my problem, that he loved us and that he had already supplied our need. So when Jamie got back from washing clothes, I told her, I said, we are going to eat food today. And I said, more than Fritos and Coke. Well, for lunch, we had Fritos and Coke. That's all we had. And then at uh, church that night, We went to church, and I thought maybe somebody would give us something. We didn't tell anybody. I think that's wrong to sit there and drop hints and and look to people to be your source. But I was expecting God to meet our need from somewhere. And finally, a guy came up at church, and he said, "Uh, could you come over to my apartment after church tonight? He lived in the same apartment complex that we lived in. And he asked us to come over, and I thought, praise God, this is how we're going to eat. We went over there and visited with him for 30 minutes or so after church. And anyway, nothing was happening. And so I said, well, it's time for us to go. So we were getting ready to leave. And he said, oh, and he went and got, I mean, an entire box full, uh, a cardboard box full of fish that he had caught. And he said he had more than they could eat. And so he gave us those fish. And he also gave us uh, vegetables to go along with it and things like this. Boy, Jamie and I ran home. She started cooking, and right before midnight, that day, we ate. And then the next day was my birthday, and I had a woman come over and give me an entire uh, cardboard box full of porterhouse steaks. We went from Fritos and Coke to porterhouse steaks for over a month. 
Amen. And all of it happened because God spoke to me and showed me about the relationship that He wanted to supply our need more than I wanted it supplied. And yet, see, most people in prayer honestly think that God is antagonistic towards them, that God is against them, and so they go as a beggar pleading, Oh, God, please give me my need. God wants to bless you more than you want to be blessed. The truth is He's already done it. Ephesians 1, 3, you're already blessed with all spiritual blessings. God's already done His part. He's already commanded a blessing over you. And you need to quit approaching God as a beggar. You need to quit approaching God as if for whatever reason He's willing to let you just die to go without because He's harsh or whatever. See, when you approach Him that way, that's actually a turnoff to God. Now, He's big enough to handle it. But it isn't faith. It isn't pleasing Him. You aren't appropriating what He has already provided. You are feeling like you've got to make God do something. If it wasn't for you and for your prayer, God just wouldn't do anything. That's a total wrong approach. And this is what Jesus is saying here. You need to see Him as a Father. You need to glorify, magnify Him. You need to pray His will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You need to approach Him boldly and just say, Give us this day our daily bread. Not because you are stronger, because you can demand it, He must do what you want, but because you know He loves you so much. And so you're just taking what you know that God has already given you. And then it mentions, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. You know, I'm out of time today. I've got more to say about this, but I'm going to have to continue this on my program tomorrow. So this week, all I'm doing is just basically trying to plow the ground so that we can sow the right seed about what prayer is. But I've already covered a lot of religious tradition. And if you've been listening, I believe that this already has helped you, even before we get into the real positive parts about prayer. So I encourage you to please get this little book. This is my free gift to you, a little 60-page booklet that I wrote. And then I have a 200-page book on a better way to pray. We also have it in English and Spanish. We have CDs, DVDs, and we have a USB that will have the video and the audio on it. And I would encourage you to please get these materials. Listen to our announcer and then call or write today. Of ministry. Andrew, I just want to say thank you so much. You were such a blessing to me. He made it simple. I think I really needed to see that. You have showed me and taught me His love. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Friday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today is the end of my first week teaching on a better way to pray. I tell you, prayer has to be an important part of any person's relationship with God. You know, you don't just come to the Lord, get your sins forgiven, and then say, bye, I'll see you in eternity. You need to have a relationship with the Lord, and you can't do that without prayer, which is just basically communion with God. But before I can teach on what prayer is, and I've got a lot of things to say that have just changed my life, I... I'm taking the approach that Jesus took in Matthew chapter 6, and he started coming against the religious way that people were praying. They were just reciting prayers. They were praying on the street corner, having people blow trumpets to draw everybody attention to them. And man, Jesus just attacked it. So that's what I've been doing. I've been trying to plow the ground, to uproot the bad stuff that's been sown, the traditions and doctrines of men, and then we're going to start getting into what prayer really is. I wrote this little introduction to a better way to pray. And again, I've mentioned this a couple of times this week, but I titled this A Better Way to Pray because everything that I teach against in here, I have done it. God loved me and I loved Him. It's not that I was of the devil because I was praying some of the ways that I've been countering, that Jesus countered, but there is a better way to pray. And so... Uh, I wrote this little booklet. This is my free gift to you. I have a 200-page booklet on a better way to pray that's been out for a long time. And I tell you, this is either one of my most loved teachings or hated teachings, depending on whether or not it rubs you the wrong way. But I, I've countered a lot of religious tradition, things that I've done. I'm not against you. God's not against you. But 
there is a better way to pray. And that's what I've been talking about. So I've been in Matthew chapter six. We started with verse five and I got down yesterday. We're in, now in what's commonly called the Lord's Prayer. I made a point that I think it's actually more accurate to call it a model prayer. These are the elements that you ought to have in your prayer, not just recite these words. And so it says in uh, Matthew chapter six, verse nine, after this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And I've already expounded on those first three verses in this prayer. Some really important things. If you missed any of this, please get these materials. Go to our website and look at these past broadcasts. In verse 11, he says, Give us this day our daily bread. Verse 12, And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And man, he makes a big point of this. Right after the end of this prayer, he says in verse 14, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And you know, there's another passage over in Mark chapter 11 where Jesus was talking about speaking to the fig tree and telling us that we have to speak to our mountain and we have to believe that we receive when we pray and then we shall have them. That's Mark 11:24. And then again, right after teaching on prayer there and how to receive a miracle, he said in verse 25, And when you stand praying, forgive if you have aught against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. You know, this is somewhat problematic because on the surface, if you read this, it just looks like that unless you totally forgive every person, if there's any unforgiveness in your heart, you can't be saved. And if that is literally accurately what it means, man, that would mean that a lot of people who profess Christianity and yet still have hatred and unforgiveness in their hearts, they're just, they, they couldn't be saved. I don't know exactly how to answer this, but I do honor it to the degree that I guarantee you, in my heart, I can, I can guarantee you, I don't have any hatred against anybody. Let me say this, that I had a man come up this last week in my Bible school, and he was a visitor, and he came up before the school started and asked if I'd pray for him, and he said he had arthritis really badly and he wanted prayer. And I said, well, I tell you what, you sit in on this first hour's class and you receive the word and you prepare your heart. And then in between the first and the second hour, I'll pray for you. And so he did. And when he came up in the second hour, I hadn't got time to go through the whole thing, but I have seen in the past that sometimes things, specifically arthritis, is related to unforgiveness, bitterness, anger, and things like that. That's not every single time. I'm not making a law out of this, but I, have, I could give many examples of people that when they got rid of the anger and bitterness, they were healed. So anyway, I just asked this guy, I said, do you have hatred towards anybody? And he thought for a second and he said, I don't hate anybody. I think I've forgiven everybody except myself. He says, I hate myself. <laughs> that was quite a statement. And I said, well, that's still hatred. It's still unforgiveness. And so I ministered to him and I said, we need to pray and you need to receive God's forgiveness for you. Now he was born again, but he still just felt unworthy and he had never forgiven himself and he hated himself. And so anyway, I prayed with him and I mean the power of God hit this guy. He could not stand up. Uh, people came up and helped him and he laid on the floor for quite a while. And the next day he came back to school and he was totally free. There had been zero pain and stuff. And it was related to getting rid of unforgiveness. And so I think that this is a bigger issue than most people make out of it. I, again, I don't know how to totally explain all of this. I'm still learning. And I'm sure that there's many of you out there that's got it all figured out. Uh, don't waste your stamp on sending it to me. I've probably heard the things. I'm just saying it hadn't become revelation from God. I'm still working on it, but I do know it's important. He said, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. You need to forgive other people. Jesus had a parable about this in the 18th chapter 
of the book of Matthew and talked about a man who had this exorbitant debt, like 10,000 talents. And then because he begged the master, the master forgave him and let him go. But then he went out and found somebody who owed him something that was just a fraction. It's like, you know, somebody who had $10,000 that they owed and they, they find somebody that owes them 10 cents and they wouldn't forgive him. They said, cast him into prison until he pays his debt. And when the master found out about the way he had treated this person, he called him in and he said, I forgave you this big debt. Shouldn't you have forgiven other people who owe you a relatively small debt? And he said, because of the way you reacted, cast this person into prison. He won't come out until he pays the very last cent of his debt. Man, if we've been forgiven, we certainly ought to be able to forgive others. Any transgression that anybody has done against you is immaterial compared to the transgression we did against God. Our sin against God caused Jesus to have to die for your sin and my sin. And I guarantee you, whatever people have done to you isn't near as grievous as what you've done to God. So if you've received that great forgiveness, you ought to turn around and forgive it to, forgive it, give it to others. In verse 13, it says, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So this is just praying for protection that we be saved from all of the things that Satan is trying to do. And then he ends it in this uh, 13th verse saying, For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So he started the prayer in verse 9 by saying, Hallowed be thy name. He ends it by saying, Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. So again, this is the way that we should approach God. Psalms 100 says, Come into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. So we are supposed to enter, and instead of keeping our eyes focused on our problem, we're supposed to put our focus on God, magnify him. You slip in your request, give us this day our daily bread. But then you end it by saying, For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. It's the way I call it a sandwich technique. You know, when you have a sandwich, you have a slice of bread on the bottom and on the top, and then you put this other stuff in between. And that's the way we should be. We should enter his gates with thanksgiving and praise and then slip in our prayer request and then exit by saying, Father, thank you that I know you've heard me. I know that I have it. I know that you are awesome. You're greater than this problem. If you would take that approach, I guarantee you, you'd get a lot greater results in prayer because most people come in and they magnify the problem instead of magnifying God. But if you were to follow the example that's given right here where you enter with praise and thanksgiving, you exit with praise and thanksgiving, if you did that, it would shrink your problem down. You know, I've actually had a lot of people come to me. Usually, I don't know why, but it seems like women are more concerned about their husband than husbands that are concerned about their wives. And I've had a lot of women come to me talking about their husband and asking me to pray that their husband would get saved. And what can I do? And you know, one of the things that I've told a lot of women, I said, quit praying for your husband. And that just shocks people. Like, what do you mean? I'm supposed to pray. Well, no, again, all prayer is not good. You have to pray properly. If the way you're praying, and I, I remember this one woman in particular I just read her mail. And I said, I can tell you exactly how you pray. You come in and you start saying, oh God, my husband is such a jerk. He's such a bad provider. He doesn't provide for us. He's a drinker. He's an alcoholic. He gambles our money away. He kicks the dog. He beats the kids. He beats me. I said, you spend 45 minutes just rehearsing all of the things that are wrong. And then you say, save him in Jesus name. If you spend 45 minutes rehearsing the negative and talking about the negative and five seconds saying, save him in Jesus' name, I can guarantee you that prayer is doing more damage than it's doing good. Now, I'm not saying that you deny the fact that the guy's got problems and needs to be helped, but you have to, like this, come in and start worshiping him. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. God, you're greater than this. You have the power to change my husband's heart. You have the power to get him off of this alcohol. You have the power to break this addiction of gambling and his anger. And you come in and you start worshiping the Lord. If you were to spend 45 minutes 
worshiping the Lord and then just slip in, thank you for saving him. And then you go to saying, for Father, your power and your, your, your kingdom is greater than anything else. I thank you that you're moving on my husband. See, now that would be a positive way to pray for your husband. But if you spend 45 minutes magnifying the problem and five seconds saying, save him in Jesus' name, that prayer is doing you damage. It's not helping at all. Your mind is like a magnifying glass or like a pair of binoculars and whatever you focus your attention upon is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And the way most people pray, they just pray about the problem and they magnify the problem. If they have a financial problem, oh God, the bill collectors are after us. We're going to lose our house. We're going to lose our car. God, we don't have enough money. And you just rehearse all of the negative things. You are magnifying the problem. And with most people, the problem is bigger than God. You have to magnify God. There's scriptures that say, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Did you know you in, in uh, reality, you can't make God any bigger. God is who he is regardless of what you think. But as far as your faith goes, as far as your heart goes, you can magnify God. You can make God bigger. You can make God bigger than your problem. You know how you do it? You start praising Him and start thanking Him. If you need a financial problem, instead of sitting here and talking about, oh God, it's so desperate, we're going to lose everything. And instead of rehearsing and just magnifying how bad it is, again, if you have experience, if you have a track record with the Lord where you've seen God come through before, well, go back to that and rehearse it and thank Him. You know, I've, I've given these examples a lot of times, but I remember one of our board meetings where on paper we were broke and my board said, we're going to shut the ministry down. You can't pay your bills. And they had a fiduciary responsibility. They were going to shut the ministry down, but nobody wanted to do it. And so we just started praying. And as we were praying, my mother called. She was the one that opened our mail at that time and made the deposits. And she called and said, we just got a $60,000 check in the mail from a church I'd never been to before or since. I didn't really know the people. They knew me because I was on radio at that time. That's before I was on television. And anyway, that covered our expense at that time. And because, see, I've seen God come through like that, there was another time where I had a, a banker who was my CEO and he had handled lots of money, but you know, it was a different thing. He had people that owed him money and if they didn't pay, he could turn them over to a collection agency and he could go get that. But in ministry, we've got partners who say they're going to support us, but they don't always send in their money. And so sometimes, man, our income fluctuates and goes up and down based on how people respond. You know, typically we have about 70% of our partners that pay their partnership on a monthly basis. This last month, I made an appeal for a building project that we're doing here at Karis. And did you know it jumped up to over 90%? That means that there was people who saw that appeal and thought, oh, well, I'm a partner, but I hadn't been paying. And so they started paying. So anyway, our our uh, income fluctuates. And this banker came to me one month and says, boy, we're in the red. We need help. I said, okay. Then he came the second month and he says, we're in the red again. And I said, okay. And finally, the third month, he got kind of upset. Like, you aren't paying attention. We're in trouble. <laughs> but you know what? I had magnified God. And I remembered the times that we were in worse shape than that. And it came through and because of that and because of the way I looked at the problem, I didn't magnify the problem. I magnified God's supply. I was able to say, look, it's okay. It'll work out. Sure enough, it's worked out. I was talking to Jamie just yesterday and we we're needing some things and uh, we were doing the same thing and just going back and rehearsing about how God has come through. He's faithful. It'll work out. But see, some people, they don't remember they magnify the problem to where the problem is bigger than God. So you go back to times that God has come through before and you magnify Him. This is the way the Lord said to start and end your prayer is magnifying God. And if you don't have that personal history, if you haven't seen God come through, take my testimonies. Go to the Word of God and say that, God, you are no respecter of persons. Romans chapter 2, verse 11. If you did it for Andrew, you'll do it for me. Or you go back 
to somebody that God provided for in the Bible and you see his faithfulness to them and you say, thank you that you are no respecter of persons. And uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6 through 11, all of these things were written for our examples so that we could learn and so that we could believe. So in the same way as you provided the need of all of the Israelis, Moses, David, whoever, go to these examples and say, you'll do it for me. And you start magnifying God. You have to put everything in its proper perspective. And this is what faith does. And so this is what this prayer is doing. We need to enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise.